Well, is there a globalist conspiracy to control everything we do, you know, from our financial transactions, you know, take away our cash, make us use their garbage central bank digital currencies? How about carbon footprint? You know, you traveled too much this month. You took an airplane flight way too many times this month, so you can't get in your car and go visit grandma anymore. You're not allowed to buy gasoline this month. You can't do that. Uh, why not go out and buy an electric car? You schlep, go out and do that because you'd be better for the globalists, right? What about our food supply? Highly processed food, they want you to eat these fake meat patties with 80 ingredients inside of them. And when you get cancer, then use our medicines as well. We made these medicines ready to go. It's all convenient, isn't it? I'm sure it sure as hell feels like there is a globalist conspiracy right now out there. And our next guest is a brother in arms in a fight against this global conspiracy, trying to get to the bottom of this agenda is Ian Carroll. He is here. He's got a great TikTok channel, which exposes these stories. And uh, it's a pleasure to have him here. And by the way, I think, Ian, you're just as sarcastic as I am. I'm kind of a sarcastic <laughs> asshole. So it's it's great to have a fellow sarcastic a-hole here on Redacted. Good to see you. Thanks, Clayton. Right back at you, man. I think that sarcasm <laughs> is both essential for evading censorship and essential for staying sane these days. Yeah, absolutely. And I find that little sort of wink and nod that you'll do with certain things in your in your content, it's it, it leaves a lot uh, left you know unsaid, but you don't have to necessarily say it. But we we pick up what you're putting down, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that coming up on TikTok as my first big platform really trained me to evade AI censorship, <laughs> and it's kind of a fun technique to sort of like put the ball in everyone else's court to just encourage everyone to do their own research, um, partially because we can't always say what is actually going on in some platforms, right. but also because it's good to encourage everyone to do their own research and think for themselves. I think that's vital, right? It's, you know, and of course, the left doesn't want you to do your own research. We did a story recently on our show how the left is going out of its way. If you do your own research, well, that's a problem. Yeah. Then you are part of the problem. If you do your own research, you can slip into the era, the 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 area of misinformation and disinformation. So you better just to tune into CNN and let them tell you what the truth is, right? Yeah, yeah it's funny how that works. I, I mean, the the Jimmy Dore piece about reading just it lives in my head every day. <laughs> like, and to, I want to also to be fair to like there are liberals and leftists out there that are intelligent and smart and do do their own research and don't buy into the bullshit of the because the left that you're referring to is basically just the intelligence agencies running the Democratic Party at this point, not right. the actual sentiment of like liberal thinking as it's intended, like as it should be and was. And I think there's a, I think you speak to I think there's a lot more that unites us in the United States then yeah. uh, then then really pulls us apart and i think you're right i think there is this apparatus probably that really is trying to divide us and so i sort of led off by talking about this you know larger global conspiracy and and i don't have all the answers and i know you don't either but you're trying to pull these pieces back do you do you think there is a, a massive sort of larger globalist cabal at play here that's really trying to drive a wedge and trying to control basically everything we do Absolutely. And I think that the only thing that stands in the way of people kind of understanding that is that people are taught not to think too hard about what those statements that you just made mean. And it's it's uh, sort of pushed on us to hear that and take it at face value as like one table with a like with eight white men sitting around it making decisions in a concise and that's not what anyone is claiming and you only need to step back and think about the incentive structures of capitalism and government to realize that obviously the whole point of starting a business is to conspire to have your business do well and the point of running a government is to conspire to have your government and your interests do well in the world and so yeah we live in a world full of extremely powerful actors with a very skewed uh shall we say playing board in the direction of the powerful and all of the powerful groups um, have their own motivations and their own agendas but many of those align and many of those most powerful groups have kind of accrued a, a following of the slightly less powerful groups and many of their agendas are kind of stacking up to the same policies stacking up to the same um, outcomes in the world and so it's not that anyone's claiming that like there's an Illuminati table with like, you know, the secret leaders. What we're what we're saying is that there are very powerful forces that have a lot of money 
that are obviously interested in furthering their own agendas, be that because of their corporate interests or be that because of their family and monetary interests. And enough of those things are aligning in this somewhat globalist agenda that gets all of their goals achieved that it if you had to put it in one sentence, you would call it a globalist cabal. But when you actually unpack it, it's highly complex. And that's why it's so hard to tell what's really going on and to communicate that to regular people that don't have the time to do the level of research that people in our position can. Yeah, we're blessed that we can do that and be able to dive into this. At what point, at what point did you have this awakening? Was this something uh, that came to you many years ago or was there was there a pivotal moment when you had this awareness that hey everything is bullshit <laughs> everyone is lying to us yeah. everyone is lying to us wait a minute i've been led down this path about climate change i've been living my life with without plastic straws i have to use a friggin paper cup uh, you know a paper lid now when i go to starbucks what the hell is going on here like what was the moment for you um, it was gradually and then all at once. Um, and for me, it was, I mean, so I grew up in Washington, the son of two teachers. I was raised left and voted left and thought left my whole life without even thinking about it. Cause I was just like, I was more concerned with going snowboarding than I was with whatever's going on in the world. Um, but Washington, you know, as Washington you get older State. and as Washington, yeah, Washington State, yeah. State. Yeah. yeah. And as you get older and kind of like, you just naturally start to think more. And that brought us to around. 2020 era and as that election played out and then the pandemic played out black lives matter played out i just started to notice more and more and more that i was not being told the truth and it was gamestop that really like flipped the switch for me because i got invested early and followed that community as they started to uncover like the base criminality of wall street and being involved in a community of sort of like online decentralized research exposing the most base corruption at the core of like the money that makes our whole system work and seeing that it's not just that we can discover the truth, but we can actually find things to do about it. That flipped a switch for me. And, and that is where I decided I have the skill set and the, and the drive to be in some sort of media space. And I need to, I want to learn, I want to share like learning and sharing are just two sides of the same coin. So it was sort of a, like, now's the time, pull the trigger. And I love your content, the way that you approach it is, hey, I'm learning here with you. Look what I just found. This is interesting, isn't it? I don't have all the answers. <laughs> and, you know, we try to do that on our show, too. We don't have all of the answers. But here are the facts that we found we'd like. And as we find more facts, we will present them to you. And you're not the arbiter of truth, but you're trying to present what you know of these uh, of, of these different stories. And of course, you've tackled some pretty big stories, right? From You mentioned GameStop. I'd love to come back to that because Roaring Kitty, of course, uh, just roared back um, uh, last <laughs> week or a few weeks ago and yeah. uh, really interesting to watch. But some other big stories that caught my attention that you've been covering and I want to talk about some of the maybe censorship things that you've had to deal with on on TikTok and sort of these big media platforms that maybe opened your eyes that there's something else going on here. It's not just a, not just a company, but there are other players involved in this. Um, you know, Michael Jackson, you've covered Jeffrey Epstein, you've covered a lot of the big, a lot of the big COVID, a lot of the big stories that, you know, you get blocked, banned, yeah. censored, like we have here on YouTube. So on TikTok, you talk about sort of having to dance around some of the censorship stuff. What can you give us a few examples of things that you've been blocked, banned, shut down over absolutely yeah i've managed to not get my main account banned but i have had my backup accounts banned and um and early on it started to become apparent that talking about jeffrey epstein was the first thing that i started talking about the low-hanging fruit that i started to notice a lot of censorship around and i immediately started treating censorship as like my guiding light is if i'm getting videos taken down over a topic then that means i should research more about that topic and i quickly discovered that TikTok seems strangely adjacent to the CIA these days, ever since Project Texas, their databases and everything are controlled by Oracle, which is a basically as close to a CIA company as you can get, different rabbit hole. And so then I started talking more about the CIA and found a lot of censorship talking about the CIA and intelligence agencies. And that led to talking about Mossad and Israel, which also I found a lot of censorship around that topic. And, and those are... I think on TikTok specifically, it sort of is like Intel agency and Intel agency adjacent 
things are probably the most censored topics, but that's it's surprising how many topics I've found that are sort of Intel agency adjacent that start to also elicit the censorship algorithms that I wouldn't have necessarily expected. Um, and TikTok is just a good example because it's so uh, it's so close to censorship, and they're trying to get along with the U.S. You know, comp like this, the intelligence complex here, so they censor extra hard. And so it's not just like talking directly about Jeffrey Epstein, but it's also talking about other ventures along along the edges of that, or talking about like why is TikTok really being banned and like what does this law do or talking about uh various financiers that are tied to epstein um people in the big banks people like jamie diamond at uh jp morgan that stuff gets censored a lot um anything that uh that supports the networks that are doing these things even if they're not even if i don't mention epstein in the video um jp morgan is a big one that comes to mind banking stuff gets censored a lot yeah for sure you mentioned well with TikTok, and of course I'm I'm curious your response and your thoughts when suddenly Congress, which can't tie its own shoes, can't pass anything, suddenly gets together and miraculously pushes through this TikTok ban. All the fingers pointing squarely at China. And of course, I smelled a rat instantly. And you have the Anti-Defamation League out there pushing, you know, Israeli backed Anti-Defamation League, wanting to get this, uh, wanting to get TikTok banned because of all of the free Palestine hashtags that were emerging. I mean, it wasn't even close. It was like a hundred to one, like the comparison. Yeah. So people were able to get information out of what was happening in Gaza, able to see what was happening. And, you know, big daddy Netanyahu does not like that. They do not like that information. Yeah. You cannot share yeah. freedom. You cannot share information and regardless of where you feel on, but you can, you, you, we've got to censor things. We've got to block certain things. So they're really trying to blame this on China. We had Congressman Thomas Massey on the show who said it has nothing to do with China. He's been in the private skiffs. He has, it, there's nothing. There's not one thing that they can point to, you know, behind closed doors that shows that it has to do with China and that they're actually spying on Americans using this. Like, show us one piece of data and they couldn't do it. Um, and he clearly believed it was Israeli backed. And this is why uh this is why they wanted it banned so when you heard all of this happening what was your response knowing that you were diving into all of this no it was the exact same response and and i did have a, a moment of like of double checking myself in the realization that i mean like i haven't really seen any anti or pro china content in in any large quantities on TikTok. like there's just not a lot of china content in general and i and i just kind of have assumed it's like because i don't really care what china's doing in like in the grand scheme of things like there's a lot of more pressing things going on but i did start to wonder like you know maybe they are censoring content about china like i should check that out and so i looked around on TikTok, and then i also made my own content being as critical of china as i possibly could i showed footage from tiananmen square i showed footage of the uyghur camps i said every every anti-china buzzword that like in in china it would get you thrown in jail right away um and that video took off it did great it had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views no censorship whatsoever but the videos that i make about israel and about like for example steve mnuchin getting together with a whole bunch of like ex Mossad and and israeli and jewish financiers in order to buy TikTok after the divestment goes through um those videos yeah they did not they did not get the same treatment <laughs> shocking um and and we all knew that being on TikTok. Um, TikTok has this interesting feature where every video is downloadable. They were sort of the first platform that included a download button, a primary feature on the app. And that allows content to spread in a different way that is sort of censorship resistant. Because if someone in Gaza or anywhere around the world sees something happening and posts a video of it, anyone that sees that video can download it immediately and and often and in TikTok, there's sort of a culture of downloading videos before they get taken down and so even when you then censor that video that then sp springs back up in a hundred other mm. places and it kind of grows like wildfire that you can't suppress and um and so that's a good example of why TikTok has had this like this israel problem despite the censorship pro-palestinian hashtags are still so prevalent even though they're also the most censored hashtags, because you can't really stop things from spreading in the way that you used to be able to in the days of sort of just Instagram. They hate that, right? I mean, they hate yeah. it. 
So you have this, yeah. dis, you know, and it's not disintermediated, but in a lot of ways it is. Now I have access, so I can download your video immediately. Your channel was just taken down, but I'm going to post it over here. I'm going to post it over exactly. here. I'm, not, I'm going to post it on X. I'm going to post it on yep. YouTube. I'm going to share it all over the place now. So, you know, big middle finger to you. Um, and you know, Edward that's actually Snowden. an ethos. That's an ethos that I took to the other platforms too. I had someone message me just the other day, be like, Hey, you got to turn this feature off. Everyone can download your videos on X. And I was like, no, 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 that's intentional because I want people to be able to spread these things. Like, it's not about me getting credit. It's about like spreading information and having seen how well that works on TikTok, I've intentionally brought that to the other platforms where it is available because I think that the diffuse nature of that sort of base principle of you can download and you can spread is uh it's a really powerful tool that's fascinating and so you knew right away that this was a rat that this was not china but even it didn't stop there you went through the research process and started looking into this okay i'm gonna i'm gonna post a lot of anti-china stuff here i'm gonna do tiananmen <laughs> square and and those videos are still up and available right oh yeah yeah they're doing fine Interesting. But yeah. other videos, like I made a video about 9-11 that was literally like a remembrance of 9-11 with like a really touching song about the lives lost and about how you only get to live once and you should cherish the people you love every day. And it was like, it was not a conspiracy video. It was not denying 9-11 at all. It was like purely like life is beautiful. Life is short. Don't like, don't waste a minute. And that video got taken down for, I think, bullying and harassment. Like the censorship on TikTok is out of control and clearly AI generated and not moderated by any like people in in you, most cases, and yet despite that, China is doing totally fine. That's crazy. So the China content's still up there. Yeah, we've had our channel. I think my I think my TikTok name is Real Clayton Morris because I got on like in the early days and there was already like a Clayton Morris. I'm like, who's this guy? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, my account has now been banned <laughs> banned three times, three times, and yeah. you know it got it got put back up like last week. And I told the team, I said, look, what were the videos that were responsible for us getting taken down? And they were about Israel. Um, it was about Gaza. So. Yep. And those were flagged and, and so forth. So, yeah, I know you're I have, you know, confirmation on our side that that's exactly what happened uh, with yep. our content as well. So you make your livelihood. I mean, really, your bread and butter has been TikTok. Has that shifted now to X to other platforms in a big way or is TikTok yep. still the main one? It has shifted in a big way intentionally. And I had some good influences in my early career, so to speak, that that told me to branch out, don't get pigeonholed into just TikTok. Don't. And I didn't realize at the time how vital that would be to my own freedom of speech and my own sort of mental clarity on what's going on. Because if you just report on a platform with that much censorship, you it's easy to not realize how much you start self-censoring and you start not doing research because you know it's going to get taken down. And it starts to change the nature of your reporting before you've even reported it. And that is like a really dangerous chilling effect on media and journalism and free speech. And so branching out to X and X starting to pay more uh, fairly, branching out to YouTube and Rumble, getting subscriptions going, doing like affiliate stuff with uh, with small and local family businesses has really helped me to sort of create a solid uh, safety net whereby now TikTok can ban me and it won't really affect my life. Where, but before it was the kind of thing where if I had been mass reported on TikTok, it could have it could have been like, how do I pay rent this month? And I, I think a lot of people don't realize how powerful of a control tactic that type of censorship is on just keeping a lid on content creation and free speech in general um, and keeping journalism kind of on rails. That's a great point. I think let's talk about that a little bit and 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 not I don't want to make this about me or us at all, but I think we can maybe you know maybe elucidate the point a little bit here. So fortunately we've been able to publish simultaneously on Rumble and BitChute yeah. and other platforms. And there's oftentimes, and certainly during COVID, you would read YouTube's terms of service and they would change and sort of flip their terms of service on a regular basis. And our team, my team, Philip, David, our, our guys would, would go over the terms of service on a weekly basis. And we yeah. get a notification when YouTube is like decided, you know, they got a hair up their butt and they want to change something. So they change their terms of service. They add in a new caveat or whatever. And we have to be careful about it. And we've decided that on those types of segments, if we're going to cover whether it was vaccines, COVID related stuff, that's where we got banned a couple of times. They took our channel down or our, uh, we weren't able to post for a couple of weeks. 
Um, we've decided now, they've sort of relaxed some of those standards, but we, we decided that we would announce to our audience, hey, we can't do our next story here on this platform. So we're going to go over here. You know, the, the stream will continue over here, whatever, on whatever platform. You can watch us there on X. You can watch us here, you know, and see that story, but we can't do it on this platform. And unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, the, we have this situation now where these platforms, um, you know, they're so unforgiving and they're so opaque. You can't tell exactly what what's in their terms of service. You can't tell when they decide to take something down. There doesn't seem to be a clear violation of any terms of service. So you're really up against this problem. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that if you have a media space where that level of control and censorship exists on all major platforms, then like, like your studio costs a lot of money to run, like your staff need to feed their families. And so if you can demonetize the people that are reporting on what's going on, then you can stop reporting from happening. And so the moment that Elon bought x bought twitter and turned it into x and changed the game like just having one outlet having rumble too, having bit shoot like having the more outlets we have that are not censored the more that fl that dam breaks and the floodgates open and it um i don't think people that aren't in the media space are necessarily aware enough of how vital just having like one crack in that dam is because it allows the free market to take effect and it allows people to realize and migrate to the platforms where you can really find out what's going on. And sometimes it's slow at first, but it's happening. Well, like Candace Owens, right? Here's a story at the Daily Wire, a story you've been covering, a story yeah. we've been covering here on this show as well. And she, of course, she was fired. Um, and you talked about mass reporting. She reported over the past couple of days, all of these accounts uh, attacked her. All of these Zionist accounts attacked her. Um, trying to get her Patreon uh, uh, taken down also and going after her. And so they can do like this mass reporting thing. Yeah. Didn't work, I think. We, and But she yeah. was able to go to X and show screenshots of this sort of mass reporting. And it, she would never have been able to do that before. Yep. And she's actually coming back on all platforms today. Shout out Candace Owens. She's coming back. I'm very excited for that. And she also, uh, speaking to exactly what you're talking about, about getting her Patreon banned, one of her employees that they tried to black, they, they tried to offer him a $3,000 contract to stay silent about the fact that he had been fired because he wouldn't go along with defaming her falsely. Um, so they fired him, offered him a $3,000 gag order. He rejected it and he left and started a GoFundMe account um, just a couple days ago, I think yesterday, um, to try to just help pay his bills while he transitions. And then I made a video about it. Um, I got some inside scoops, made a video about it. And within an hour of my video going on X, GoFundMe took his fundraiser down for undisclosed reasons. And I was like, in interesting. It's weird how everything's tied together. And uh, the moment, it's almost like they, like, like these groups that are sort of all aligned to these narratives, they wind up picking scapegoats of like, this person's too big and they're saying the sort of things that are dangerous to our goals. So we need to get that person in specific. And Candace is one good example. Alex Jones is another example in some other ways of, and, and Candace has thankfully fought back with everything she has and has, has done a good job of bringing good people around her to help her like win that fight. And I think she's winning and I think it's exposing just how in city, like how ingrained, even in alternative media, a lot of these sort of like pro-Zionist and or pro-corporate or pro-globalist agendas. They're, they're in a lot more than just the mainstream media. You bring up a great point about in, in, independent media. This is something we've been wrestling with and thinking about a lot lately. You know, you think about CNN, you think about Fox News, you think about, you know, the Today Show. This segment is brought to you by Pfizer. So we're used to that. We're used to that whole yep. piece of it, the biopharmaceutical complex. We're used to the CIA being infiltrated, you know, and, and being able to hand information directly to the New York Times and to, the, and to CBS News and all of that. That's long, well-documented history. Um, and, uh, you know, as intelligence agencies have told, members have told me, if they want to get a story out into the mainstream media, they go to the New York Times, the Washington Post, that's where they plant those stories. So we, we know that that's all there. But the independent media, yeah. now we have this rise of independent media for so long, people sort of looked away, you know, they've looked away at like the Daily Wire and these other, these other things as sort of like, those are the, just the rebels, rebels without a cause. They have no money backing. They don't have any financial backing. Uh, but they do. 
And so in many ways, this sort of independent media has become in a lot of ways, the new corporate media. Yeah. And it's, it's a really cool example of sort of decentralized media doing its job where, you know, we played a little bit of catch up for a while. A lot of these independent media sources that were not actually independent had their rise. They had their moment in the sun, but sooner or later, once you have free speech in decentralized spaces like X, for example, sooner or later, truth starts to come out. Things start to get talked about and researched. And the moment that like, you know, one wrong thing happens, they have to act in a way that covers their interests, their interests get exposed. And then pretty quickly, the decentralized media can crack the story wide open. And what's happened at the Daily Wire is a shining example because they've handled it so poorly. But what's cool is that each time that happens, um, we all get a look behind the curtain of the playbook and we start like now it's pretty obvious you look at the daily wire and you think like huh they did rise in a really interesting way like very quickly with a lot of like very high quality like just just this seems like there's a lot of money behind their rise and a lot like like the way was made for them and when you think back to it it's like oh that's what it looks like when big money with their own interests backs an independent media source and so we sort of learn and adapt and overcome in a way that i don't think that the powers that be the globalists are really prepared to deal with because to be like most of them are 80 years old and are born in a whole different world and can't even imagine the type of uh like mental resilience that today's generations have the type of tech fluency that today's generations have and I think that with every passing day, like the hive mind of our decentralized intelligence only gets stronger and the uh, outdatedness of their tactics only becomes more apparent. What do you think is going to happen with sort of the decentralization of news and when everyone is its own Twitter and you're, you know, you are your own, you are your own Twitter with your own server and we don't have to rely on Twitter. We don't have to rely on X. We don't have to rely on Facebook's servers yeah. to shut you down in terms of service. But now, hey, come over and visit Ian Carroll's, his very own decentralized social media platform and big middle finger to you. You can't shut me down, a-holes. Yeah. I think it's, I think about this all the time and I'm so excited for what this part of the future holds. And people are quick to point out the shortcomings of sort of decentralized information spaces in the sense that yeah, you may be more prone to falling into disinformation or following the, the wrong lead and coming to the wrong conclusions because suddenly the locus of control is internal. Like your understanding of reality is based on your own synthesis rather than trusting a news source who is, you know, legit. Like basically centralized takes all the thought processes away and we don't have to think about what's real and we can just trust this news source. And now we're having to all realize that it's on us to figure it out. And that inherently forces everyone to think more critically or get misled. And I think that over the next 10 years, we're going to watch this massive shifting back into sort of like intellectuality because suddenly we can't outsource understanding. We have to produce understanding for ourselves. And I think that the cultural shift that comes with that, like the dumbing down of America that has been carefully orchestrated in our public school system will be inherently reversed because it's becoming more and more apparent every day that if you are not intelligent, you are not informed because you have to figure out it, figure it all out for yourself. I love that. I'm excited for children because, and I think you're starting to see this. I mean, I don't know if you have kids. Um, I've got nope. three of them. And uh, so my, my house is constant chaos, but I've got a 13 year old. Yeah. And he said the other day there was an assembly and they had, you know, this guy came in to speak about 15 minute cities and he was from like some big company. And I said, okay, but my son has been taught to think critically. And so he knows to question these things. And he said, yeah, they were really pitching it to us as this smart city and this is the future. And he, and he said, I had a lot of questions. And so he was engaging me and, you know, just to get some more understanding of it. And I was explaining how, how it's being pitched and then maybe what do you think about this, that they would take away these things? And, and so I think, and he's, he talks also about a lot of woke content, a lot of woke things that pop up in schools. And he, he, along with his, his friends, I'm hearing this from other parents. I know this is anecdotal, but I'm hearing it yep. among adolescents 
that they're very aware of that they're sort of being played. And I don't know if it's because they have access to social media in such a way or they this information and they're seeking it out themselves to get answers. But it doesn't sound like this young group of individuals is really like a hive mind where they're just fo- sort of following sheep, like sheep like. What do you think? I agree completely. And I actually have worked as a teacher um, in various capacities for many years of my life. And middle school is my favorite age to teach because they're like young enough to be still alive and wildly creative. They haven't necessarily been crushed yet, but they're also (laughs) thinking like adults. They're very inquisitive. And most of all, they have a really high bullshit meter. I think that people don't realize how astute like, like young teens are at smelling bullshit. And especially nowadays that kids are growing up on the internet, like like my generation, I'm a millennial, I'm 31, and my generation developed the bullshit meter for like TV advertising by the time we were 12. We like we just tune that out because we all see right through it from the start. And I think that to, people sometimes don't transpose that level of like cultural awareness forwards to the youngest generation that's growing up on social media, that's growing up inside of the information warfare, and they see through it like like right away. And I think that yeah, a lot of kids are growing up in families that are totally bought into the propaganda and it'll take them a little longer to come around. But I think that inherently the the globalists and those with these agendas think that they're they I think they think way too highly of their own ability to trick people and I think that people are inherently smarter and more resilient than they get credit for. And maybe we're nowhere is that more apparent than what's been happening with GameStop, right? And so yeah. this older generation thinking they can just trick you. No one's really going to look into this. We've been controlling this for a long time. And now, oh, yeah. shit. And now, oh, shit. So your response to seeing, first of all, I was watching the live stream. It was hilarious. Um, Natalie and I, were we, yeah. we, had, we had a night of it. We just sat down and we watched the live stream of Roaring Kitty coming back. And, uh, yep. and it was, you know, it was fun. It was spectacle. 600,000 people watching a live stream. It was amazing. Yep. Um, do you, where do you see that going? You're, you're an investor in GameStop. You were there from the beginning on, on wall street bets. And is it, is it really a David and Goliath story? Yes, um, it is. And if you're like conspiratorial and mind, conspiratorially minded and you haven't been from, there from the beginning, it's easy to look in from the outside and be like, uh oh, no, that's a false flag. That's a, but like, no, from being inside up from the start, there are too many factors that came together in synchronicity from organic origins that it's not the kind of thing that you can orchestrate. Um, and no one knows where it's going to go and i don't speak for everyone by any means but from my perspective i'm extremely optimistic about what's going to happen um aside from all the crazy theories just based on like the fundamentals of the business and where it's at and based upon the fundamentals of the market right now but um it's been really cool to watch roaring kitty come back and just sort of like read into what he's really doing and what's really happening in the markets and the stream is a good example where um it would be easy to have seen that stream and take it at face value of like this degenerate is 21 minutes late to his own stream and he's like not saying anything intelligent and he's drinking a beer and it's like this is ridiculous and to not and to not think any more about it but when you zoom out and look at what's i mean let's remember that the guy yoloed like 30 million dollars into call options that expire on a specific day like this guy is a pretty sophisticated investor and that's how he made all this money in the first place he has very acute understanding of the markets and he he always has and so to take his stream at face value is a little naive naive yeah. and if yeah and if you look at the way like mainstream media was all live streaming his live stream when it was supposed to start and it was amazing to watch the cringe of mainstream media waiting on his stream to start rearranging their whole day just to like watch him come on and then he comes on and trolls them the whole time and it was hilarious time, i was watching simultaneously cnbc and bloomberg yeah. i had two different screens going watching that simultaneously as they were waiting for roaring kitty and they knew they had to cover it. That's the funny part of this, right? They had yep. to cover it. They all like they reluctantly have to cover crypto now. You know, I love watching these old exactly. coots on Bloomberg have to cover this stuff. And then he comes on 21 minutes late. And then when he comes on, he's there like wearing a 
like a, an arm sling with band-aids all yeah. over his head and you're like what the hell you know and they just didn't know how to handle it i loved it i loved every yeah. second of it <laughs> Yeah. And then during the stream, I mean, if you really think about it, he put to bed the narrative that he's manipulating the stock during the stream because the stock got halted when he was supposed to start and then he didn't start. So it got unhalted. And then when he did start, it, it kept halting over and over again when he would like say thing. And, and so, and the price did all sorts of crazy things when he is clearly just showing us that he hasn't actually sold anything. He's just sitting on the same exact position. And so if it's his movements, that's driving the price around, uh, I would love for people to explain how the price moved during his live stream um, because he's just, he's got a thesis and he's not necessarily giving it away, but he's standing by it with, you know, $30 million of input. And uh, I mean, either way, we're going to get an answer about what's real within the next couple of weeks because all those calls he has expire in, I think, 11 days. Yeah, it's fun to watch. And it's also fun to watch the rise of crypto. It's a fun to watch politicians try to figure out and stake out their positions yeah. on this. And I've been certainly watching Democrats kind of come unraveled about it, drawing their lines in the sand. Elizabeth Warren, Senator Elizabeth Warren, of course, is all in on a D on a central bank digital currency so that they can yep. control and, and manipulate all transactions. They want to take away cash, which is undeniable. Yeah. They want to do that. Uh, we know the positions of Wells Fargo, Bank of America on cash. They want to remove cash. So we're moving towards this digital currency future who will control it will it be you and me the people's currency or will it be a central bank digital currency what do you think is going to happen over the next uh, couple of years this is one of my favorite avenues of of investigation because more so than a lot of them it's really complex and it's complex from the nature of finance but it's also complex in the sense that intelligence agencies are almost certainly involved and it's hard to parse out how much and in what parts um there's scams that may or may not be like legitimate scams or they may be intelligence agency backed in some cases and there's all the big banking's interests um and and so i love trying to parse it out and my i think where i'm at today is that i think there there's obviously a huge push by globalist parties banking parties to arrive at a future where they have control over the next global currency, CBDCs being their obvious choice. Um, but I think that Bitcoin specifically and, crypt and blockchain as a technology in general is out of the bag. And I don't think you can put it back in the bag because all it is is math. It's just code. And that code is already dispersed around the internet. And unless you shut down computing as a concept, unless you regulate all computers, you can't stop that reality from still existing and so i think that they're fighting a battle they can't win and it's wonderful to watch them try because the only the only world i see where we don't wind up with with people in charge of their own money is if bitcoin was actually started by the cia literally and has some back door built in that no one has found i think that's the only possible future where they actually manage to control the future of digital currency and i don't think that that's real. I don't think that's So you possible. don't think, <clears throat> and we can end it here, you don't think the CIA created Bitcoin, Satoshi no. is not a CIA asset. Totally no, it's separate. a fun theory to explore. And right. it's also kind of a fun rabbit hole to explore the like, maybe an AI is Satoshi Nakamoto. You know, it's fun to entertain, right. go down right. that rabbit hole. But I don't think I, I have not found any evidence that convinces me that there's much weight to any of that. Wouldn't that be crazy? But I still, though? you know, stay open and I keep looking at it. Yeah, the, the meeting weird. of AI and blockchain as like a synchronistic uh, environment and how they th they train each other, they interface with you. It, it's very interesting, very deep rabbit hole to go down. What stories are you watching right now that are really exciting to you over, you know, as we head into, we're heading into some really dangerous territory this summer. Yeah. Um, we've got the Republican National Convention, the Democratic National Convention, if that even happens, it's going to happen yeah. in Chicago and whether or not they'll have President Biden uh, coming in virtually and not being able to show up there and whether they will cancel it altogether, or whether, whether, whether we will have an election yeah. this fall, whether President Trump's conviction will be overturned through a mistrial, will he go to prison? I mean, it's not to mention nuclear war. It's a very busy yeah. summer. It's a very busy summer. I think that the most interesting story for me is the thread that sort of 
runs through everything you just talked about. And it's there's lots of threads, but the one that I'm most interested in is sort of the ongoing exposure of what really looks like a Zionist mob or Zionist mafia operating on a global scale. And I'm not saying all Jewish people operating in a cabal. I'm saying like specifically certain people aligned with Israel and Zionism that are working in a complex, uh, kind of in a complex RICO style organization to affect global policy, to affect American politics, to affect, you know, the uh, entertainment industry, all sorts of different facets of what really looks like a international criminal organization in a lot of ways. And as that gets exposed and its interests in the war in Gaza or its interest in American politics in the U.S. election, its interest in media and music, etc., as all of that comes to light, it's really fascinating to sort of watch us collectively navigate the complex waters of disclosure of information, of cultural shifting without overcorrecting to hatred and violence. It's just it's just a really fascinating story that's so complex that we're all going through together in our own ways that um, I, I just love digging into those sorts of like outcome unclear path unclear but the journey is certain and it's already underway so yeah the journey is really going to be interesting and i think you're right and i think the war in gaza right now and the ethnic cleansing that's been happening there is has really shined a light in a way that we might not have had yeah. maybe ever yeah. i mean it it could have remained in the dark we might not have known that every member of Congress has an APEC babysitter, to use the phrase yeah. of Congressman Thomas Massey on Tucker's show, that every one exactly. of them is basically babysat by APEC. Um, you know, it's except for like a few of them, I th maybe a handful of them. It's, it's yeah. remarkable. And now we're seeing this. We're, and look, knowledge is power. And do you think that's a good mm -hmm. thing? You know, the viewer watching right now, do you think it's a good thing that a foreign government basically has access to every member of the American Congress? I'm just asking, like, if you think that's a great thing, okay, you, you're, you're a free country. But we might not have known that, right? I mean, and I think no. we're sort of on this collective journey of awareness now, thanks to social media and thanks to this uh, independent journalism that's been able to shine a light on this. Yeah, I, I don't want the statement to be misconstrued as me... Uh, as me saying, I support all the death that's happening over in Gaza and I support what Hamas has done in general. But I, right. I do always, I often think about like Hamas probably realized this would be the outcome. Like it seems likely to me that at, cer at a certain point of their decision making as a group, they were deciding we're going to put us Palestinians through hell because by doing so, that's the only way that we think we can break the sort of global sp of of silence that Israel has affected in the world. And I, I just can't help but think that they knew that a version of this would be the outcome, that they would have to go through great sacrifice and death as a people, but that it would probably expose a certain amount of the agenda and the silence. And it's, it's regardless of whether they planned it or not, it's happening. It's happening on every level. And I think everyone's experiencing it in their own way and everyone's waking up to it in their own time. Um, so I hope we don't overcorrect to hatred and to, uh, you know, our own forms of violence. Um, I hope that we can find a middle ground of peace and of understanding and reconciliation. But it's going to take hard work on all of our parts. I agree. And also the piece that, you know, hey, October 7th, it was clearly well known ahead of time that this was about to happen. And the stand down yeah. orders that occurred for many, many hours uh, that kept the military yeah. from actually going in. That's that's well documented now as well. So yeah. you could look at it from the Israeli side to say they needed this to happen. So allowing yeah. a false flag to happen, allowing this to happen, because now it gives them carte blanche to go in and take up all of this land to build their massive oil pier along with the United States so they can get all of those oil, natural gas resources right there in the waters. And it's all about money. We get full land, full land grab. And for those of you watching saying, they would never want a land grab, just go back to 1967 and the attack on the USS Liberty, which was a total, and, and the Six Day War, that was a land grab war. You don't have to take my word for it. You know, you could, for crying out, you could read Joan Mellon's great book called Blood in the Water to understand um, that history. Um, but so I, there's a lot of interesting questions about this that I think a lot of us collectively are sort of learning together. And if we can keep the hatred down and just present the facts about it, 
you know, I think that's a, that's a good place to be. And, and, and if you show me facts, the most important part, yeah, right? how flexible their job is to, their job is to divide us, to stoke hatred. Every time that we start to focus on like, you know, we're all pretty similar and we're all fighting against a common enemy, which is the powerful, the, the globalist, the rich, and the only weapon they have that can continuously win against that is division and hatred. Right. And so, you know, regardless of the fight, resisting hatred and and standing in the center with you know rationality and decency and conversation you know having the flexibility like you say to listen to the other side and to let ideas just be ideas and not become a personal you know hatred is like the number one thing for i think everyone to keep in mind going forwards because we're just getting started like the, the the kinetic war is just getting started the information war i think is going to get a lot more heated um, I think that we're in for a wild couple years. And I think facts are important. I mean, present me with facts. Yeah. I'm absolutely able to look at facts and look at atrocities by Hamas that were carried out on civilians. I'm able to look at facts, um, you know, as to what an individual president does against his political opponents. I'm able to look at facts of the Argentinian president versus, you know, I just present me with facts. And hopefully, yeah. I mean, I'll ask you this. Are you a flexible person? Like you have a... yeah. Do you feel like you have any lines drawn in the sand that if someone comes to you with facts, you feel like, oh shit, that really upended my worldview. Mm -hmm. right? Now I need to change my position on this. Um, I try not to, and it's hard to, it's hard to succeed at that. And I think that the reason for most of us is that we, it's easy to confuse that sort of like open-mindedness that we sort of inherently know. It's like, yeah, I'm obviously I, you, I, my mind would be changed if you could change it. But we don't quite like do the second step of logic there to realize that there's this sort of expert bias where we all as people, we have this desire to be correct and informed and to be, you know, seen as competent. And the moment, especially if you're a content creator, especially if you're in the, like in the media saying things like it's my job to tell people about the world. And so we have this inherent like built in bias to become an expert at things. And once we speak our opinion, we feel like we need to stand by it. And you need to sort of like in, understand that in yourself and realize that your value, our value as people does not come from our rightness as like a speaker. It comes from our, like our humanity. It comes from our willingness to listen, to speak like ideas are not us. And I think that, I mean, I intentionally remind myself every day that it's not about me getting anything right. It's okay. It's, it's honestly better to admit you're wrong when you're wrong. That goes way better online than trying to stand on a hill that is falling. Um, but you have to be cogent of it and you have to be cognizant that like, you don't need to stand by everything you've ever said because it's okay to change your mind. And if you're not changing your mind, you're not learning anything, right? If you, if you yeah. never are wrong, that means that learning has stopped for you. And that is obviously ridiculous when you look at it from that perspective. You, no one knows everything. You, there's always more to learn. Yeah, and asking good questions too. I think that's yeah. so important. And you should always be leery of the people that don't ask questions because it, 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 it kind of puts up a false front Oh, that person's too too good for his own good, and you know you're yeah. in a room. You, you know the person who you, you're you're at dinner with a group of people, and the person just never shuts up and wants to tell you all about him him or herself the whole night, and never asks yeah. a question. Um, yeah, and one of the key indicators that I look for is emotion. Is when people get hmm. emotional in conversations or in debates. That is like the first telltale sign that they you you've hit a barrier behind which they are not comfortable questioning their own beliefs and accepting other evidence whereas as a person who is you know competent and confident in their own intellectual position they don't need to be offended they don't need to get emotional or angry when someone refutes them because they can just look at the evidence and if they understand it and they have something that refutes it, they can just discuss that. But when people are presented with evidence that challenges these like deeply held ingrained beliefs and they don't have a fight against it, there's a natural human response to push back with emotion. And that's where you get all the flame wars on X. That's where you get all the pundits stoking hatred and fear on mainstream media because you know, it's very beneficial to the globalist to stoke an emotional response to disagreement instead of an intellectual one, because intellectual responses usually lead to the truth. Hmm. I love it. I love it. Ian Carroll, 
has been my guest. It's been great getting to know you and fascinating and, and so great to hear. Um, you know, I'm 47, so 31. I love that a, a younger generation is is leading this charge right now. It's exciting. I can't believe I'm saying younger generation. I sound like an, uh, man, when did that happen? <laughs> I'll be saying it soon enough too, man. <laughs> Son of a bitch, when did that happen? Um, well, it's been amazing to get to know you. Love your content. Um, everyone, where can people find you, uh, Ian? What's the best place now? Um, cancel this clothing company.com has links to all of my social media and other like free resources about corporations and products and stuff like that. Um, and if you really want to, you know, follow along with what I'm doing, X is probably where I'm the most is definitely where I'm the most active and that's cancel cloco on X. And from there, it shouldn't be hard to find me everywhere else. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for teeing this up and spending, spending some time with us here to kind of give us your, your thoughts and your worldview and, What's got your brain cooking these days? We appreciate it, Ian. Thanks a lot, Clayton. Thank you for leading the way for all of us.